Welcome back, everyone, to our Sunday School series in the Gospel Project. We are going to be starting in the book of John today, in John chapter 5, actually. First, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, precious, wonderful Lord, our God, our Savior, thank you, Lord, for loving us, for blessing us in so many ways. Lord, we thank you that we can study your word, that you, through your Holy Spirit, give us understanding. We pray that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Okay, starting in John chapter 5, verses 2 through 7. Now, now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic, called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps down before me. Now, before we uh, discuss this too much further, let's make a little pointed note here that in some translations, you may see some verses between verses 3 and 4, or it would be called 3b and, and verse 4. And in some translations, you'll see those just in the footnotes. The reason for that is that these words are not found in the earliest manuscripts for the Gospel of John, which is why most translations include them in the footnote instead of the main text. Most scholars believe that a later scribe sought to provide further context for this story and thus shared the common belief that people had at the time. So what those verses say and explain is that an angel stirred the water ever so, every so often and the first person to enter the bubbling water would be healed of whatever ailed them. Now that's not part of the original text, so it's not, it was not included here, but I thought I would give you an explanation in case your translation has those or if you see those in the footnote. But it also gives an explanation of that uh, statement in verse 7 that the man said, I have no one to take me into the water when the water is stirred up. So let's continue on then with, with taking a look at, at this passage. This man had not walked for most, if not all, of his life. It says for 38 years. He was dependent on people for most of his basic needs. His only hope for healing in the pool was always taken away from him by someone who was faster than him. We all know that feeling of helplessness in our condition and that that can lead to a feeling of hopelessness or a feeling to feeling hopeless in life. We have all experienced this to one degree or another because sin has debilitated all of humankind. We all know something is not as it should be, yet none of our solutions have helped us. We are helpless to save ourselves. This disabled man could not help himself, but Jesus could. Likewise, the only hope we have against sin and its consequences isn't religion or irreligion. It is a person, only Jesus. Jesus asked the man if he wanted to be well. And the man's response revealed he was filled with despair. His only focus for healing was the pool, and he couldn't get into the pool in time. It's interesting to note here that in some of the previous passages we have looked at in, in the last several weeks, where people who had some kind of, of health condition or, or need, and they had heard the reports about Jesus, and how he was doing miraculous works and healing other people. So they went to Jesus, or they called out to Jesus for healing. This man didn't even know who Jesus was, which we'll see that a little more fully here in a moment. He was seeking his healing at this pool. He wasn't seeking Jesus. 
Jesus came and found him. Being hurt without hope and alone is a recipe for despair. But Jesus is the ultimate healer. Jesus is the solution to our hopelessness and despair. No matter what the cause of that hopelessness, Jesus is the cure. Let's continue then in verses 8 through 15. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. Jesus healed the man not by taking him down into the pool of supposed powers, but by commanding him to get up and walk. There is power in the word of the Son of God. And when Jesus speaks, diseased and disabled bodies listen. When Jesus speaks, you and I need to listen. The man had not professed faith in Jesus or even asked for healing. He didn't even know who Jesus was, as we mentioned earlier. And as it said there, when the Jews asked him about it, it says he didn't know who he was because Jesus had slipped back into the crowd. Nothing in his scenario indicates that this man, of all the sick people lying there, deserved to be healing. He didn't deserve it any more than any of the others, in other words. Yet this man experienced grace, the, the grace of God in his healing. Jesus grants a gracious healing to us as well, healing us from sin and its consequences. He does this not because of anything we have done, and certainly not because we deserve it, because we don't. He saves us from sin because he is good, gracious, and he loves us. Jesus later found the man who had been healed and told him no longer to walk in sin. Jesus cared not only about the man's physical condition, but about the man's whole being. Not only did the man need to be healed of his broken body, but he needed to be healed of his broken desires. The ultimate purpose of the grace Jesus showed the man in healing him was so he might walk in holiness. Now note, this does not mean that this man's infirmity was because of sin. But Jesus was pointing out that he did have sin, as we all do, and he needed to go forth from that day and walk in holiness, and not sin. We have been granted healing spiritually for the same ultimate purpose, that we might walk in holiness, no longer enslaved to sin, but living by faith in the Son of God who came to save us from our sin. You can see that in Galatians 2, verse 20. And going on to our last section in this study today, in verses 16 through 18. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Imagine this man's joy in every step that he took every step that he walked for the first time in decades. But when he carried his mat into the presence of the Jews, all they saw was a man breaking the man-made Sabbath laws meant to keep people in compliance. The Jews then turned their fury onto Jesus himself. This, however, was not a violation of God's law, even that had been given through Moses, but a violation of Jewish tradition that a person could not carry an object from one domain to another. Jesus himself performed work 
as they put it, on the Sabbath by healing the disabled man. To suit the Jews' legalistic mindset, it seems that Jesus should have waited just a few more hours for the Sabbath to be over before healing the disabled man. Sounds rather ridiculous, doesn't it? But that would be what they were thinking. First, the Jews persecuted Jesus for his work. But then they ramped up their efforts when they understood Jesus' claim as to his person. When Jesus said, My Father is working, he was claiming that he was the Son of God. He was claiming that God was his Father. By saying that, he was implying, in part, the wonderful mystery of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Jews understood enough to know that Jesus' claim would have been blasphemous if he were not equal to God, because Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God, one and the same, three persons in one. So if he was one of those, he was claiming, in fact, to be the others, which were God. So that is why they wanted to kill him. But Jesus is indeed who he claimed to be. He is the Son of God. He is, in fact, God. And talk about the Sabbath here for a moment. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's Genesis 1-1. And then the next few verses in the first two chapters of Genesis tell us that in six days, he created everything else. Then, on the seventh day, he rested from his creative work. But maybe you never thought about this before. I'm sure I I hadn't thought this for, for quite a while. Just because God rested from his creative work, rested from the work he had been doing in making all of creation, does not mean that God stopped working in other ways. God has continued to work in preserving his creation, in providing for his creatures, and in his providence for his image bearers. Therefore, God is still working, just as Jesus said, and the Son of God follows in the steps of his Father by working without ceasing for the good of all creation. Think about it. How many times have you or I called on the name of the Lord on a Sabbath and asked for his help? And he actually worked and did something for us, in us, through us, on that very day. How many of you perhaps can remember back when you were first saved and you called on the name of the Lord accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and he saved you that day. He delivered you from sin that day. He worked. (laughs) How many of you are glad that God works on the Sabbath and every other day? He continues to work. He never ceases to work in us and through us and for us. And for that, I am grateful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, precious Lord, our God, thank you that you never cease to work, that you are always working in us and through us and for us to accomplish your great work, to accomplish your salvation, to accomplish glory for your name. We thank you, Lord God, for your faithfulness. Lord, help us to share that truth, that love with others. Lord, in the midst of a a world that seems so dark and, and fallen, which we know it is, Lord, we pray that you would help us to be the light that you've called us to be in the midst of this darkness, to shine forth as stars in the universe, as your word tells us. Lord, help us to share the truth of your gospel with those around us so that they too can be saved and know your precious work in their lives as well. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you, and I'll see you next time.